Hi, Internet. I've done something really dumb, and I want to tell you about it because maybe it's not dumb, but it's probably dumb. Okay, let's talk about the motivation mediator. <laughs> what am I doing in this video? I don't even know. Okay, everyone seems really excited about mediator, especially all these clean architecture people. I can't be bothered with that stuff. I mean, clean architecture, I can... When you just say those two words, yes, I'm on board, but then you start going like, oh, CQRS and all these things, and maybe I just haven't found the right use case. But let me show you how Mediator ought to work. Um, so here's an existing project. This is my game Star Kindred. Woo, might as well shout that out. Go look at it. Doesn't matter. You don't have to. Um, and here is an endpoint. This is, and this looks like super normal ASP.NET Core API stuff because it is. I'm not using Mediator. Um, but I'll kind of show you what it would look like maybe if I did. So we've got a, this is like to get a list of all the alliances. Um, and I have broken things out. I like the whole ver vertical slice architecture thing. If you want to throw around more clean architecture terms, see, I care. Um, and so every class has everything it needs. Here's the request DTO. Um, here's the responses. Uh, you know, we've got a few little nested things here. Um, and then here's the, the endpoint. And there's one endpoint per class, right? Everything that is needed is, is in the one place. Fine, whatever. Um, but other than that, it's a standard you know, API. We've got our controller, we've got some methods in here, except we only have one. Um, and then here's the thing it does. It hits up the database, turns things into this DTO. I happen to have this like standard paginated thing that all my, or paginated, however you like want to say your A, um, <laughs> thing that all my DTOs do when you respond with it. Great. Great, great, great. So far, so normal for an API. Let's say you want to do Mediator. Everyone's like, oh, use Mediator. You don't want to do all this stuff in your controller. How unreusable and et cetera. So what we would do if we had Mediator was something like, I Mediator, here's Mediator. And then I think you would just do Mediator send re request, right? And somewhere all this stuff would get pulled out. All this stuff would get pulled out into a little Mediator request handler. And you'd say, oh, what a beautiful endpoint I've created. It only has one line. I'm looking at this, every time I look at this, it's like, why do I want to write a bunch of one-line functions that just pass through one thing into another? Like, if I was going to write a function called do, you know, raise one number to another power, I wouldn't be like, oh, you don't want to call that directly. You want to make a your own power method that takes a thing and then returns Oh, right? Like, you wouldn't run it. If, if ever I saw a one-liner like that, I would refactor by saying, hey, maybe get rid of this method and just, like, call math pow directly, right? So, so I don't know. So then when I see, like, mediator like this, and I I get the value of, of separating things out from your API so you can reuse it, but it's like, okay, but when I want to reuse it, I'll do that. I don't know. That's always been my argument. Anyway, so mediator, I just, I just can't get on board. Um, and so if you like mediator, you already hate me. Except, hold on, don't stop watching yet. I found a context in which I do like Mediator, or two contexts. So one context is I have been loving it as of yesterday uh, for a, just an internal, why don't I just revert my changes, what am I doing? I'll do that later, you don't care, I can sort that out myself. So for a purely internal API, which I don't know, it's not worth showing, but, but here's what Mediator looks like, right? And you're like, and, and this might be, you could imagine this being wrapped in a web API, except in this case it isn't, which is what makes me like it. So here is a request handler, a good old Mediator request handler. There's a request and response object. I'm putting them just right inside, because why would I put them anywhere else? And here's our handle method. We go to the database, we get some things, we turn them into DTOs, and we return them, right? Basically the same thing as before, except this is what it looks like in Mediator. And the reason I like Mediator here is there is no web API. This is like a purely internal application API. I'm gonna have a little game, and you're gonna do stuff, and everything you do is I'm gonna do a Mediator request, and then we're gonna hit databases or other internal states and services or whatever. And in my brain, it is very much like a web API it, it, it is. It's an, it's an application API with, with, with that, that I haven't happened to wrap in the web yet. So anyway, I was doing this, and then this morning, I woke up, and as I was like barely you know, regaining consciousness, I remembered type discriminators in the JSON serializing stuff. Type discriminators. Ben, if you use type discriminators, you don't need any URL endpoints except one. And, and then... We don't have to write, you know, what I would call, well, I shouldn't say faffing about, I'm not British, but that phrase is just so fun. All this, like, making a bunch of stupid little one-liner endpoints, right, which just, let's use more fun phrases, gets my goat. I never say that either. Um, what's happening to me today? Uh, yeah, why do I want to do that? I don't want to do that, but I don't have to. I can use mediator and I can use type discriminators <laughs> from Newtonsoft JSON and not do any of that. And if you know anything about type discriminators, you're going to be worried about security. 
but I've found a way to address that. Uh, and if you're worried about getting posts, you're like, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, GraphQL says, ah, we'll just make everything post because some GraphQL queries will, will you know, be a query and some of them will be a, what you'd call a command, right? If we're in a CQRS uh, mindset, right? And so we just do them all in one post endpoint with your GraphQL endpoint. And I was like, well, I don't know. If it works for GraphQL, it can work for me. Why not? So here's the project I have made. Um, it's a super simple thing. It's going to look similar to, uh, let's just minimize this. We're not looking at that anymore. And I'll just have this take up the whole screen. All right. This is just a silly, this is called a silly application. As you can see, here's our silly application. We have a fruit. We've got two fruit <laughs> handlers. One of them gets fruits and one of them adds more fruits. Uh, I have what I'm calling a repository. I just wanted it to look a little bit like a database, but I didn't want to bother setting up a database. Uh, the repository is just this. It's a list of fruit in a string, mango, cherry, pomplamoose. Um, because that's such a fun word. How would you not have pomplamoose in your list of sample fruits? So this, again, pretty standard. We're going to say we're going to handle this request. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to think that this was a DB context, you might actually, you know, select out the fruit, get the names, except in this case there, and you go, oh, I got to turn it into a list, whatever. It's not a real database, so we don't have to do all that stuff, but just pretend if it makes your brain happy. And this is okay. This is an endpoint. And then I've got another one to add fruit. And I do a little checking here. If the repository already contains this fruit, we're going to say no, get out of here. Um, otherwise, we'll return fruit. And, and this is a little success. So I didn't worry. I was kind of thinking, it's like, oh, am I going to set up like 404s or, or in this case, I don't know, 422 unprocessable entity? I don't know. You know, whatever response code you want to return, you would probably actually do instead of having a response code like this because your response code would be 200, OK, or 422, I don't like your fruit. Um, <laughs> that's what 422 the code means. I don't like your fruit. Make up your own HTTP code if you want that. Um, so this is a little silly to, a little contrived or something to have this response thing, have this Boolean, but whatever. We don't have to worry about that. The point is we've got these two things and now I would like to wrap them up in an API, right? But me, Ben, I cannot be bothered to make all these silly endpoints where it's like, get the mediator, pass the request, that's my whole function, why did I waste my time writing this? So I thought, okay, we'll have a single endpoint. So here's my single endpoint, and we'll get into the rest later. Don't look at that, that's spoilers. Here's my single endpoint, map post. Um, I should do the thing so you can see my mouse cursor, except that pulls up the run anything? No one wants that, get out of here. Okay, so I'm saying, look, I've got a post. The root of the API. Everything you just go here. Every request you want to do, just go to the just go to the root of the API. I'm gonna get your context. I'm gonna get mediator. Okay, and then I do a little silliness to deserialize. There's like some weird problems. If you try to like, this was a little silly to figure out how to get to work with NewtonSoft because this HTTP body is a stream. But if you use the NewtonSoft deserializers to to like re from the, to read the stream. Then ASP.NET Core is angry because it doesn't want you to do synchronous stuff, only asynchronous stuff on its streams, and there's a setting where you can disable that, but maybe that's not the best practice, blah, 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 blah. So I just found something that worked. If you wanted to like finesse this a little more and come up with something maybe a little happier, there's certainly room to do so. But I just said, whatever, fine, I'm going to read the whole thing async. Now .NET Core is happy without setting a funny setting, although I don't know, maybe setting the setting is fine. Someone online said there were performance issues, and I just believed them and said, okay, I won't do it that way. Um, and another disclaimer, in addition to the fact that I just like fever dream or whatever woke up imagining this thing, I've done like no testing, like well, does this work at scale? I don't know. Um, but I did think of some security issues which we'll get into, so that's good. Um, so anyway, let's deserialize the thing, great. Uh, if we fail to deserialize, I don't know, right? We shouldn't be throwing an exception, we should whatever. Return a 500 or whatever you want, a 420, I don't know, return something the proper way. I just threw this in just to get anything um, because I need a null check, right? Because this need this request can't be null. Um, so I need some kind of null check, so I just throw in a, a throw. But anyway, and here's the whole thing I was talking about, right? Return mediator send request, um, although I kind of did it wrong when I was typing it before because I left out the, con uh, the cancellation token and the await. But right, that's your one-liner for, for your methods. So how does this work, right? This handles all of the things, all of, all of, somehow, right, this maps to get fruit and add fruit, and I can demonstrate that with the, with the scratches down here. I'll, I'll do that later. In fact, maybe I should do it now. How does this work? Oh my gosh, does it? Do you believe me? Uh, I'll restart just in case there's changes, question mark? I don't think there ought to be. Um, so let's go to get fruit. 
so here, here is it. Well, spoilers. We're using the type discriminator, which I already mentioned, right? Um, and we'll talk about why maybe, the, like, you might be looking at that being like, hold on, Ben, there's a problem. And there is, and I know there is, and I'm going to talk about that, but let's talk about that later. Let's, let's run this. So this is our request, and we got mango, cherry, and pomplamoose, as we would expect. And let's add a fruit. Here's another one. Um, you may remember that the add fruit request does require something. It requires a name. Uh, so when we add fruit, we, we better provide that. Uh, we'll run this request. It's going to say success true. And now if we go back to get fruit and we run this, we will see, oops, yeah, I don't know why it loses focus the second time, but here it is. Now we've got mango, cherry, pomplamoose, and nanner. And I don't know if we added fruit again, it's going to say no good. You've already got that in there. Why is it lose focus? Okay, success false. It's already in there. And, and indeed, if we get fruit, sorry, clicking on all the wrong things, it's going to be like, yeah, I already, right, didn't add nanner a second time. So whatever, it's all working, right? We've got our beautiful API. Um, I don't usually use these, like, I don't know, there's a funny feature of writer, this, like, request thing. I thought about using Postman. I was like, oh, that costs money now. What a pain. Insomnia 2, I think, has gone that way. So I was like, where's my free REST client anymore? I don't know. So I use this. I was like, oh, yeah, writer's got it built in. So anyway, don't worry about that. Let's talk about this type discriminator because this is where all the bad things happen <laughs> that, that probably makes this not a great idea. So not great idea number one. Is that any better than a URL, right? Like, why not just have, right? Why have all this stuff when instead you might just say fruit.get? That looks like a lot less typing. <laughs> I would say the advantage would come in is if you're using C Sharp on your client. So if you had a desktop client that you, where, you, where you could sit, basically share, right, these, these, um, these objects. If you could have the request object and the response object shared, across you know, your client and your server, you'd pull this out into some shared project, uh, then that's great because you can serialize and um, you know, it'll just automatically throw in that type discriminator if you've set up Newton soft JSON properly, which again, I'll look at in a sec, um, that configuration. Um, and, then, and then you don't have to worry about the endpoints anymore. And, and this is the thing, right? Like I'm making this Blazor app and Blazor is one place where this comes up uh, for work. And you've got all these like, clients, refit clients, and you can auto-generate those using Swagger, and you set up all the stuff. Um, and it's fine, and it works, and it's good. Um, but then now you've just got all these little interfaces, and you got to remember, you know, like, okay, what's the interface, and blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, that tells me the request object I need now. i got to new that up. It's like, well, what if I could just go to one endpoint? What if I didn't have to worry about any of that? Um, what if I didn't have to generate all these things, right? What if I could save hundreds of lines of code is kind of what it comes to, down to in my brain. It's like, just get rid of all that code. We don't need it. Throw it all out. You can just use a type discriminator. So that's one area, I think, where it would be advantageous. If your um, client was TypeScript, then this is probably less attractive. Where was I trying to look? Right? Because what TypeScript JSON serializer is going to do this type? Like, it doesn't know all these things, right? So you're just going to end up typing all these anyway out, or I should say JavaScript, I guess. Um, I think TypeScript does because I do Angular for my front end things usually. When it's, when it's up to me, when it's up to work, we're doing Blazor. Okay, we're doing Blazor. When it's up to me, I'm doing Angular. Um, I don't even want to talk about what I think about those two frameworks right now. Um, <laughs> they're both good. They both have their use cases. I'll say that. Okay, so anyway, if you're using JavaScript on the front end, you're going to end up typing all these silly, <laughs> all these silly type discriminators anyway. And so you might as well have just done URLs. What did you really save? Um, so, so anyway, uh, or, and again, you can, you can use code generators to like find all your, you know, generate a JavaScript, uh, like API for your web API, right? There, there's things, there's tools that do that. I have less experience with those, but anyway, they exist, right? Um, so why not just use that? So anyway, so that's kind of problem number one of this is like, it's not as, it's, it's just as inconvenient as tracking URLs, unless you're sharing the, the DTOs between uh, the back end and the front end in the language, right? C Sharp, so you can use Newton Soft JSON, which also is kind of heavy. It's a big library to put into your front end, so maybe that's not so great. So well, let's, let's not worry about the Again, I said this might be a bad idea. Okay, here's the bad thing number two with the type discriminators is there's a really big security vulnerability. Just think about it. We're allowing the user to say anything they want. Why should it be silly application? Why don't they say, you know what? We're going to do silly database. Um, I don't remember what we had in here. Oh, we don't really have entities, right? But you could you could just name anything. And so you could start probing for types that might exist on, on the API. Uh, and who knows what will happen, right? You just somehow you now compel the, the server to instantiate some object. What happens when that happens? Right? Who knows what happens, right? There might be a... You're opening yourself up to like, just like all kinds of problems. I don't know if there's denial of service attacks, most likely, yes. 
Are there weird ways to, you know, get access to things you're not supposed to quite possibly, right? Very, very bad to ask, give the user access to every single class in your application. Very, very bad. So that's okay. That problem I do have a nice solution for. So when you set up JSON serializer, and again, this is Newton soft JSON. Um, first of all, you got to say here, hey, here's my type name handling. And there's a few options here. You can do all, or there's like auto. I forget the details of auto. Um, I'm doing objects because and there's also like array. But basically, this is saying when will it use the type names? Is it when you're doing arrays? Is it when you're doing X, Y, or Z? In my case, it's always going to be objects. It's always going to be these um, DTO records. And I'm using records because records are great. And I'm sealing them because you should see all your stuff. Uh, but never mind that. That's a thing for another thing. Uh, oops, spoilers. Okay, yes, back here. So we can just safely say, yeah, just make it objects. We might as well limit it. We could say all, but we know they're going to be objects. So right, let's be restrictive unless we need to be more permissive. Uh, but here's the more important thing because that's only, that's not going to offer you much protection on its own. The more important thing is you can, with JSON, uh, Newtonsoft JSON, they will give, that you can write custom classes to say, how should we figure out how to serialize or deserialize? And the default, if you don't provide the serialization binder, is that it will do things like this, silly application fruit. Like it's, it's basically the full name. If you had a type in C sharp and you said dot full name on that type, you would get this, um, a string that looks like this. Sorry, I moved my hands across my monitor in real life, which no one can see because this is the internet. Uh, but anyway, you would get a string like this, very long and, and ugly. But what if you didn't want that? I mean, that is another thing. Maybe you would clean up by saying, I'm just going to do add fruit or something. But then, but then you're going to have to do more work in the code I'm going to show you. So let me show you that code. I'm, Kind of going all over the place. You may have noticed. Okay, so here's what I did. We're just so so. Here's what bind to name when it serializes. And right now in this code, there is no serialization. Again, if you had a C sharp client for this API, this silly API, you would hit this function. Um, this function says how ought I to serialize the object? Um, assembly name we're not going to include um, by default. Newtonsoft JSON will put the the assembly name as a comma separated thing. So it would have done like, whoops. I didn't really see that. It would do like silly application as well. It does this comma separated thing? I don't know why it bothers. Maybe there's there's probably some good reason, uh, but you probably don't need that. Just say well, right because your name's your it's going to be here anyway, right? You're unless you've been something wacky. Um, so anyway, we can leave out the assembly name, and you might no notice these are outs, right? So rather than doing a tuple or some sort of class return, they've decided to use outs. Very classic C sharp stuff. Um, so right, I'm going to give you a type that I want to serialize. And here's how you're going to figure out what to put in that dollar type, right? That's the binding thing. And this is very close to the default behavior. What's more interesting is, okay, when now when I'm asked to deserialize, how do I know what type to deserialize into? Again, by default, it would just look at that string name and say, okay, I'll just go find it. I'll just go find that type and new it up, ask no questions, oh, no security vulnerabilities, that's really bad. So instead, we make a whitelist. We say, hey, I'm going to make some list of known types. And you could, if you wanted to, make a, a hand-picked list and, and type all these things in. You could do silly application, write that whole thing. And you could, you could whitelist manually uh, all the types that are allowed. And, and that's what this does. So bind to type, given some type name and assembly name from that dollar type variable that we saw. Does it show it in, in this thing here down here? No? Okay. So anyway, but you saw it. Ah, I'll go back. Uh, so where are we? Right, this dollar type, right? This this information is going to get passed in to the known types binder as type name. We're ignoring assembly name because I don't care. Maybe you do. Um, and we're just going to find the type. It's like, what type do you want to use? Well, we're going to find it from the known types based on its full name. Again, this is type dot full name equals that kind of string that we're seeing. You could you could do other things here. You can't just use name in my case because all of my things are called request and response um, because they are right. If we go back here, right? I've called this request. So there's going to be a million things called request. We can't rely on just the name. Um, so that's why I'm distinguishing on full name here. But again, you could imagine other schemes that maybe you could come up here. This is where you can kind of get creative and do what works best for you. How do I find the types? How do I build the whitelist automatically? I chose to do it from mediator. Any of these um, types here that implement I request, we know are valid. And that might be danger in a larger, dangerous in a larger context. Maybe you do have like private internal mediator objects communicating with each other and that, that you wouldn't want to be so, you know, blindly take every single mediator request, right? You really want to make sure that the only ones that a user can make are the ones that are for your API. And so maybe you could make attributes. You could make some custom attribute here to mark up the, the class you wanted, whatever, use whatever method, or, or maybe you're really 
clever in how you arrange your, your projects. And you can say, yeah, only the mediator things in like silly dot application. And if I had other mediator stuff, that always goes in another project, right? You can come up with whatever convention works for you. But in my case, I said, okay, I'm going to go into whatever assembly I'm given, right, for known types binder. And I, I just made up this constructor. I could take anything here. I could say, yeah, and I want to take in into how much do you like Pomplamoose, uh, 1 to 10. Whatever, right? I can, this is just, you can make up whatever constructor you want. I don't even know why I bother to demonstrate. You're a programmer. You know you can do that. Um, we're implementing this iserialization binder is the important thing that requires these. But anyway, I want to find any, right, this is my type. I request of anything, this generic um, type. And I want to find any types in the assembly provided that have that interface. And so in my program, I said, hey, get the assembly where get fruit lives, right? We're doing this assembly scanning thing. Here's the one assembly I care about, the one where you can find get fruit. Cool. We're going to pull out all the interfaces, or sorry, all the types that have an interface <laughs> that is a generic and which implements this I request, this meteor I request. And so that's how I build up the whitelist here. Again, you could do it manually, you could come up with other conventions, you could you could use attributes, you could do whatever you want. You could make your own interface that maybe you just say, you know, I don't know, also implements I API response, right? Whatever. You can you can mark them however you want. Um, and and then you've got your nice whitelist and no one's gonna uh, do a thing that's bad. You know, use a use a type that they shouldn't be asking to um, instantiate like I mean let's do an example do you want someone to be able to new up your program they shouldn't be able to so I'm going to try and it's going to tell me no that was bad um, you got an internal server error <laughs> response body is empty so but and I think what's happening in fact I know what's happening is here this function and this is something I'm not totally happy with uh, the iserialization binder says hey I need a type you're not allowed to say no type you're not allowed to say null this is Right? No, no. You're supposed to return a hard type. And I'm like, well, but I gotta... What if this is null? Right? So in this case, we hit here. We didn't find the type. We returned null, except this can't be null. Somewhere an exception is getting thrown, and so we're seeing this 500. Maybe that's fine enough. I don't know. I would like something a little, little nicer where I could say, I don't know, you know, make a generic... Maybe I return some other type that then goes to a mediator thing that, you know, whatever. There's other ways to handle this, surely. I didn't get any further than that. So anyway, this is the ridiculous thing that, again, I just half dreamed as I was waking up in the morning, uh, a way to use Mediator without, again, like my main hang up, without making all of these API endpoints that just say, turn this thing and put it into Mediator and return one line. I'm going to have 100 endpoints. I'm going to have 100 one-line methods with a bunch of silly declarations and all the shit I got to type, right? I don't want to do it. <laughs> so anyway. Um, that's it. That's my thing. And again, you know, if you're a clean architecture, like a clean, clean architecture person, you hate this. You look at this and you hate this. <laughs> and that's fine. I don't even know that I like this. I'm not recommending that this is a thing that anyone should do because I don't have any experience doing it. I only dreamed of it this morning. Um, it might be terrible to scale this up. Uh, but I just wanted to throw it out there as, I don't know, it's a weird combination. I think what really like stuck in my brain was like, oh, mediator plus type discriminator equals this, right? <laughs> like. I know there's a path, and then I just had to Google to figure out all the little details and the security vulnerabilities. I was like, oh, I don't want that. Um, so yeah, again, is it a good idea? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's good for what you're doing. Um, I don't know. I, and I really feel like in most circumstances, it's just it's fine. You can just do this. It's fine. Just make your get endpoint and do your stuff. <laughs> you can pull it out into a common place when it needs to be in a common place. Is always the the thing I think, right? When you're like, oh, I've imagined a situation now where I'm going to make a desktop application that, but it doesn't hit my web API. It wants to talk to code directly, I guess. I don't know. CLI tools, maybe that's a good place where you might want to be able to reuse this logic. I mean, I don't know. At that point, I would say, okay, then I will. I'll pull this out into a service and I'll inject the service and. Maybe that service is mediator. I don't know. But but this function doesn't need it. And until it needs it, I'm not doing it. Uh, don't do work you don't need. Uh, don't, I don't know, optimize before you need the optimization. Don't architect before you need the architecture. So I'm not going to throw in mediator in every endpoint. So anyway, that's my take. Some people hate that take. Um, That's it for my silly video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that was interesting. And that's all I'm going to say. You know how to use YouTube. 
Oh, and um, this repository, I'll put a link in the doobly-doo or the description, however you like to call it. Um, you can pull it and you can abuse it and you can tell me how it's bad and you can make merge requests and you can do whatever you want. Um, I'll be receptive to different types of those things in different ways, I'm sure. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much again. Goodbye. I didn't press, why did I press this? Did you see that shit? I just pressed the stop button here. That's not the stop button to stop recording. Stop button, stop recording is over here. It's right here. I'm pressing stop now. <laughs>